the history and the story of the First Nations people of Australia is incredibly important to us culturally and to our future as a nation. That's why there are at least two specific focus areas in the Australian Professional Standards for Teachers that deserve our attention. And yet, when we looked at the data early in 2022, it was the most neglected focus area of all, which is really sad. So today I am being brave. I am taking a small step towards a deeper understanding of First Nations Australian people and a deeper understanding of what I can do as an educator. So if you're curious about ATSI perspectives in the Australian curriculum, in your teaching subjects and in your evidence, keep listening. Hi, I'm Selena Woodward and I'm an English and drama teacher, university lecturer and with edufolios.org, a big time reflective practitioner. So how can reflective practice help you grow your teaching skills, fall in love with your profession all over again and help you nail accreditation and teacher registration with less stress and less work? Well, this is the Reflective Teacher Podcast. Hi there and welcome back to another episode of the Reflective Teacher Podcast. As always, I am your host, Selena Woodward, and you may have noticed I am not alone today. I am far more excited than I should be. No, I am exactly the right amount of excited to be joined today by two incredible people who I connected with back in December last year, I believe, when I realized that the Edufolios data was showing an interesting trend. And that trend was that the least discussed focus areas in our beautiful Australian Professional Standards for Teachers rubric were all the ones that talked about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander anything. They were missing. And so I went on a little mission to try and find some voices who could help us to solve the problem or the question, the puzzle of why it is that we are just not doing that. Now, you've heard me talk on this podcast many times and confess many times that this is a real area of weakness for me as an educator too. So what I'm doing here is being a bit brave and I'm sharing my learning journey with you live on the podcast. So I am joined here by Stuart Bogle and Emily Hagee from Australians Together. Welcome, you guys. Thanks, Selena. Thanks for having us. It's so exciting to, I'm so excited to have you both here. So I'm going to start, as I always do, by asking you to tell us a little bit about yourself. Stuart, what's your story? Depends how long we've got, but uh, it's great to be here and we're excited to be able to share as well. But my journey began as a young fellow who decided he wanted to do some good in this world. And so I started looking around at what I could do and where I could serve and where I could help. But I probably had that um, complex that said, I'm the the white fellow that can do things in different parts of the world. And I realized I needed some skills. And so I decided to become a teacher. So I went to teacher's college and I spent those four years just racing through so I could get the qualification and head off into the outermost parts of the world somewhere. But I um, got to the end of that and and realized I probably needed a bit of experience. So I went to my first uh, teaching interview and uh, they said, look, how long, if you, if you were successful, how long would you plan to stay here? And I said, oh, 12 months, because I'm going out to work in the outermost parts of the world somewhere. I stayed there for a lot longer than 12 months. I had 10 years there and I was developing all sorts of experience and ended up being a, um, a principal there right at the end and really enjoyed that. Uh, I did some study at a theological college as well. And so I had, I had all this preparation to go and do some good in this world, but ended up really uh, running an adult college um, for a bunch of students from all over the world. And that was really exciting stage of my life. I started a publishing company to produce children's books to help teachers and children's workers. And I got to travel around the world doing that. And again, people used to say to me, is that a not-for-profit business? And I'd say, is no profit the same thing? Because we we really didn't make a brass for our zoo out of it, but we had a lot of fun. Uh, But about 12 years ago, I was going through a particularly difficult stage in life and I had some family issues and some health issues and was really at a bit of a hole and somebody reached out to me and they said, would I help them with their foundation that they were just starting? And they said I could really choose anything I wanted to do where my passions were and I was so interested in justice issues that I, I could choose something and this was exciting. But because of my context or the situation I was in, 
I really could, couldn't do anything. And so they offered me flexibility. They said, why don't you just do one part of the work then? Why don't you have a look into something that's really important to, to me? Uh, this guy said, he said, um, I think there's a wound in this nation and it goes back to first contact with indigenous people. And I'd love you to explore that with me. And I have to be honest to say, it felt like the booby prize of work, like of all the things, this one was not the thing I wanted to do. I was much more interested in exciting things all over the world, but not in my own backyard. But because it seemed like the answer to a, a really complex situation I was in, I said, sure, uh, I'll have a crack. So I spent the next year just looking around the country at what was happening with Indigenous people and that relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. And it just blew me away. And I, I think it was only a few weeks in that my apathy and disappointment at this work got me thinking about, how did I not know this? How could I have been a school teacher and a principal and lived in this country all my life and, and not known what's gone on in this country. And so what I call a, a bit of a holy discontent grew in me to say, I need to do something about this. And so that's where uh, the journey of Australians Together began. And we started off by doing some funding to help, um, you know, essentially, I think the mindset was to help poor Aboriginal people come up with some solutions themselves. But I was just perpetuating the model that had been taking place in this country for a long time, which is I had the power and I had the money. And I said, look, I can help you. And if you do the things that I think are really good, I can give you some more. But if not, I can withdraw them. And what I was doing was innocently, but I was perpetuating a power imbalance that was taking place all over this country and was actually contributing to this wound in the nation. So that um, changed in us and we changed our strategy and we tried to do everything. But I think there's an old saying that says, if you're going to eat the elephant, you've got to do it one bite at a time. And I was trying to do it with taking the whole thing into my mouth. So after a few years of trying to do everything, we realised we needed to focus. And so a very difficult decision was to shift everything that we're doing to a single sector focus. And that's why we now work with teachers and with schools and kids, because we realise if you're going to change the narrative in this country, you have to get to the next generation. So that's what we've been doing over about 12 years, but particularly over the last three years, really focusing in the education space. And that's why we're here sharing with you today. That's fantastic. You are. I love that. I love the fact that you were like, oh, God, do I have to? But I could hear in your discussion there, this the social, you even said the social justice. I thought as soon as you work out the injustice, you're going to be like a dog with a bone. I can imagine what happened. And they're like, whoa, we've unleashed the beast. Oh, good Lord. Fantastic. That's brilliant. That's great. Thank you for that. Emily, how about you? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, okay. So I came late to teaching. Um, having already had kids and everything. And I um, actually started as a yoga teacher and I was enjoying the teaching side of it so much. I thought, okay, I might give the real te real teaching a crack. Um, and so I went back to uni and I studied teaching and I got a job. So I worked as a teacher for six and a half years and I trained in English and English as a second language. And that's where I, you know, I thought I was going to, you know, help all these refugees with their English. And I just could not get a job in that area. There are a lot of English teachers out there. I'm not sure if you're aware, um, but I did manage to get <laughs> good roles anyway, you know, um, and what ended up happening though and i think it happens to quite a few teachers um is that i was given a lot of has classes to kind of fill up my contracts and i found i loved it i, I same as Stuart, i loved that the social justice aspect of it and uh, trying to um, encourage students to care about what's happened in our past and care about what's happening now in um, in Australia and across the world. It was um, it was the environmental aspect of of geography as well, which I really loved. Um, <clears throat> and in that work, I uh, in, in the history work, we were looking at the Year Ten uh, Rights and Freedoms Unit, um, and I taught that four years um, in a row. And of course, every year I was digging that little bit deeper and finding out more. And I think it was in the second year that I um, was working on the subject that I came across Australians Together's website. And it was just such a find for me because I, I knew in the previous uh, year that the students had needed to hear from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people about their experiences. And so when I came across um, Australians Together's 
articles with the little embedded videos from First Nations people's perspectives, actually telling their story about topics that, as we all know, are so poorly represented in education. Um, just as a little aside, I was doing a presentation uh, last week and at the end um, of the presentation as part of our professional development um, workshop, one of the principals who had organised it stood up and she said, I cannot believe that I did not know this information. This is a woman who I think was probably um, in her uh, 60s and as well, it's 2022, you know, and these, I, I am still struck by how valuable this learning is for people and, and where it can potentially take them in their own personal lives, but also in their professional lives. So I came across Australians Together um, website and particular articles on there about colonisation, about assimilation, about stolen generations. And I just was able to use that material directly with my year 10 students. It was perfect for them. Um, and I felt really comfortable with it because it was referenced and it, the language being used was really um, empathetic and careful without being um, fussy. So that's where that connection came in, and I was able to use that material over those um, over those years teaching that unit and finding other ways to pull it into other areas um, that I was teaching in. And then I saw this job ad for Australians Together, and oh my gosh, my heart leapt out of my body in excitement and. Um, you know, I wasn't sure about whether or not um, th that Australians Together would be you're the girl for the job, but turns out I was. And uh, so here I am now. Uh, I coordinate um, a collection of fabulous teachers who write for us. Um, and we have our uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, cultural collaborators that work with every single one of our resources to make sure that those are culturally appropriate and that they contain um, as much um, useful resources beyond what we've brought together for teachers to use. Uh, and we also have many editors and designers that work on those resources as well. So that's what I get to do every day. and. I'm pretty happy about it. <laughs> That's amazing. Emily, yeah. as I was listening to you, I'm an English teacher too. I did have the absolute honour of working with refugees. I worked at Theberton Senior College for a bit. So I'm like, oh my God, we've got a similar journey. Um, <laughs> and one of the first jobs I had when I arrived in Australia properly, not when I was backpacking, but when I decided to live here, um, was at a school where, just as you described, part of my timetable was Australian studies. And I was like, really? <laughs> okay. And I had to teach the unit on all the Indigenous stuff. And I was literally reading the textbook like a couple of uh, days before I'm planning my lessons. But it was so valuable because I was outraged and I would rock up to the lesson going, what is this nonsense? I am mortified. These are my ancestors. I had no idea we were so awful. And the, the girls I would teach them were like, oh, yeah, okay, like I took that energy in with me. So I get that. And, um, and as those of you watching or listening to this, you can probably see why these people are resonating really well with me. They get it. Like they've been in education. They understand the problem, but they understand it far better than I do in that they've actually immersed themselves in that problem really deeply and have then dedicated their time to helping other educators benefit from that immersion and their knowledge. Like Emily's saying, they're working directly with Aboriginal Torres Strait Islanders to help support the resource development. They're creating resources for us. And so you can see why I'm excited today, can't you? Now, it's all awesome. Thank you so much. I'm still very excited. So Stuart, I'm going to direct this question at you. Um, I guess when I looked at those numbers at the beginning of the year, the end of last year, and I could see that the ATSI stuff was just not happening. It was the first time, actually. Every year before that, it had been assessment that no one was talking about, which had always bemused me, because how can you reflect on student progress without assessment. So we've solved that problem. And now this new truth was coming out. And I was like, oh no, 
and I and it really made me pay attention to my own uh, understandings too. Like I say, I did a bit of study in this. I was outraged by it, but when it comes to embedding the cultures and the language into my English teaching or being able to understand those cultures and languages so that I can connect with somebody from one of the local countries or any, you know, the Ghana people here in Adelaide, I would be terrified. Um, I have a lot of fear, honestly, about doing the wrong thing, saying the wrong thing. Um, and that fear actually stops me from even trying, if I'm honest, I'm being very honest here. It's not laziness. It's just I don't know what the rules are. I don't know how to behave. I'm not even from Australia. So I have the biggest imposter syndrome ever. Although sometimes I think not being from Australia probably gives me more permission. <laughs> I don't know, but I'm English. I don't know. It's all very scary. You know, Stuart, what, what is going on? You've been here. You've been working in this field for a long time. Why are teachers not feeling confident? And What's going on? What have you noticed? Yeah, I think uh, what you've described is exactly why we're in this space, is that teachers have hearts that want to do the right thing, but sometimes yeah. their head's full of these fears and concerns and lack of confidence. And I think that lack of confidence piece is the key piece that we came across really early. We actually did a, engaged a, a research company to go out and, and ask um, teachers, why aren't they engaging in this space? And the number one thing that came up was confidence. They weren't confident in, confident in what they were teaching. They weren't confident in their knowledge, their understanding. And so a really tiny percentage said they feel confident to um, integrate this into their teaching. So you've got this, this aspiration that says, hey, 1.4 and 2.4 in the teacher standard, you need to be competent in doing this. And we've got a car, we've got all of these curriculum resources that you're meant to be doing and embedding this into your practice. Uh, we've got the cross curriculum priority. So is this aspirational stuff? But on the ground, it's meeting people going, I don't know how to do this and I'm scared of getting it wrong. So with that in mind, we thought, how do we help build confidence in teachers, help them to know they don't have to be an expert? But it's such a tricky and emotive area that people are so concerned that if they were to raise their voice, they'd get shot down. Someone like you, Selena, you're a teacher, but you're also you know, you're a white woman and you've got an English background. And these are the things that you go, oh, should I even be talking about this? So I'll go and find an Aboriginal person to come into my classroom. And then suddenly they go, I don't know any Aboriginal people. And, and what I've seen on the media, it's a bit scary. And um, and where will I find them? And so there's all these concerns and these all combine together to stop us doing anything in the classrooms or, or make it's only tokenistic what we do in the classrooms, which was my experience. I'd come across this and know I should be teaching something and I have no clue how to do it. So I just would grab something and I would add to the narrative of getting things wrong or, um, you know, making or, or actually teaching kids to think the wrong way about this. So I was adding to the problem. So that's why we've decided that the place to start is with teachers and to help build their confidence in a way that there's no blame, there's no guilt, there's no shame. Let's have a look at what happened in the past, how that has caused so much pain and how that's continuing to have an impact to this day. And let's realise we can't just put our head in the sand and say we can't do anything about it. One, because professionally we're told we have to, but two, because we're Australian citizens and we're part of the story. So I use a, a line that says there's a story that needs to be told because a new chapter needs to be written. And regardless of whether you do this or not, you're part of writing that new chapter, either adding to the ignorance or adding to addressing um, what we call this wound in our nation. So we think it's really important to have this conversation. And I'm one of the areas when I first started, I was scared stiff to be the white fellow that said he wants to work in this space. And I got smashed on occasions by people saying I had no right to be in this space. But then I'd meet other people who'd say, we can, other Aboriginal people would say, we can't do this on our own. We need allies. We need people who stand with us. So I never speak on behalf of Indigenous people. I never go, hey, I want to teach you all about Aboriginal culture. It's not my job. But what I do is I have a voice to non-Aboriginal people, which make up 97% of our population. And so we've got a conversation that needs to be had. And what we're doing now, and some of your listeners might be thinking, hang on, you got three white people talking about Aboriginal stuff. No, no, we're not talking about Aboriginal stuff because that's not our right. What we're talking about is our country and the story we're part of and the part we're going to play to address that going forward. So that's why we think this is important, Selena, and that's why I'm really excited that you've chosen this as a topic because it's not an easy one and one that's often avoided. I know. And you know what? You really got me then. I went, oh, when you said, you basically said that 
if I if I continue as an educator to just go la 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 la, not my problem, too scary, then I'm not only am I being a bit professionally naughty, let's be honest, I should be doing that, but I'm actually choosing, and I am, and I'm, I'm really not comfortable with this. I'm actually choosing to be part of the problem because I'm choosing to be ignorant and I'm choosing to perpetuate that ignorance. That made me go, oh. Like, and I know that's probably, you probably, oh, did I say that? You probably just made like, a, but that's what I took. I was like, oh my God, that's really powerful. Um, so I'm really glad that I found you guys because yeah, this is really important, isn't it? It's, you know, I hear from the people that I coach through accreditation all the time. Oh, but I don't have any ATSI kids at my site, so I can't do that, you know? And, I'm, and I know, because I'm human too, <laughs> but that's probably just coming from a, oh, now I've got a justification for not leaning in, not being brave, because you're right, this is brave, right? I don't know why it feels so scary. It's a cultural thing, I think, and I, I've only been in Australia a decade, but I can feel that there's a, a lot of pain. I think that pain is is there, and you're right, it's, it's really brave, but you're right, we also need to create more spaces where three white people like ourselves can at least have a conversation, be brave, show up, and make a decision to not be ignorant anymore, make a decision to try and understand and to work with the local communities. And I guess that's exactly why they are in the standards and they are in the curriculum. So, wow, I don't know if that was your intention there, but that got me. No, I'm glad, I'm glad that it had that impact, but I absolutely, I think there's something in the liberation theologists of South America, there's a quote one day that said, you can't side, you can't take neutrality in these things. You are, Even to say you're neutral and you don't have a voice means you're siding on the side of the oppressor. And I think it's the same in this space to say, hey, I don't know anything, so I'm not going to do anything. You're actually siding or you're adding to the narrative, which is that we've got this huge gap in relationship and understanding between our First Nations people of this country and those of us who are not part of that. So I do think it's really important, but you made the comment too about teachers saying, well, I don't have any... Um, First Nations kid in my class, it doesn't relate to me. Or other people say to me, I never stole anyone's house. It wasn't my problem. It's happened a long time ago. And if we just take that from a professional point of view, that standard of teaching, there's no Aboriginal kids in my class, that's 1.4 about teaching them and helping improve their outcomes. But 2.4 is that promotion of reconciliation between First Nations and, and non-First Nations people. So we have got a responsibility, but I want to take that further to say, this isn't just a professional thing. This is actually a personal thing because I don't know what your background, Selena, but you've landed in Australia and you're putting some roots down here and you're contributing to the story of this country. So one, it's good to know the story of the country and two, it's very important that you realise the part that you're going to play going forward. So we can either perpetuate the ignorance or we can actually dive in and say, I'm, I want to understand and I want to contribute in a positive way because for so long we've said, this is, this is not my problem. Um, that's actually, I, I don't know any Aboriginal people, there's none in my suburb, but I go, no, but you're Australian and you're part of this, you're living wherever you are on contested land and it hasn't been resolved and it's a sore point and it's painful. So if you think this is just to do with the government and they can solve everything or it's to do with those remote communities out in the middle of nowhere, you're missing the point that we're in Australia that's actually, this is our story and it's our story to wrestle with and I can't think of a better group of people than teachers to wrestle with it and do it in a way that takes some of the angst and the and the anger out of this and says, let's just have a look at what happened, look at what's still happening, but let's dream about what could happen in this country. And that's what I get excited about when teachers get hold of this and they start to share this with the kids. And then I hear the voices of kids going, how do I not know this? Mm -hmm. And then they begin to see things differently and experience things differently and take that conversation to their dinner table with their parents. That's what gets me excited. I saw, I, this is a bit off, it's not off topic, it's perfect. And I don't know why I was showing this, but yesterday I was flicking through TikTok as one does. And there was this little three-year-old girl, I don't know if you've seen this one, sat in the back seat and she'd been given a colouring in sheet at some Indigenous place she'd been to with her mom. Good job, mom. And she could read it, but she's obviously a bright cookie. And she'd worked out that she didn't want to be the white fella anymore. And she was really upset. She didn't want to be the white fella. She wanted to be the brown fella, she would say. She was a beautiful little, and she was like, and she was like, why don't She's like, because they stole the babies and I don't want it. She was really absolutely moved. It was so beautiful. And you know, 
that mom probably had no idea <laughs> that her child would understand the pain in that depth. But that little girl <laughs> has already got probably more understanding than a lot of kids that I've taught, you know, definitely more than I did when I first got here. You know, and as a British person, I can tell you, we are not told anything about the colonization of Australia, apart from we were a great nation who had an empire. We're not told how that empire was built. And I was absolutely, I was like that little three-year-old myself, like, oh my God, I don't want to be British anymore. I'm going to burn. <laughs> that would be illegal. Um, but, you know, I, you know, I get it. So I think you're right. Um, and I love that invitation to be imperfect and be brave and be courageous. I absolutely do. I think that's kind of, if that's the only thing you take away from this podcast, good, go be messy, get it wrong, and then learn how to get it right. You know, like all of us have to. That is in fact what learning kind of is. So we have to go through that to learn. You know, Emily, I know that, you know, if we look at the teaching standards, continuing what Stuart was saying, they, you know, the teachers are, <laughs> It's really broad, isn't it? The language isn't helpful. And I've also noticed that I keep saying ATSI and you two are not saying that. Why? What's going on? What's <laughs> happening here? Am I doing the wrong thing? Am I being imperfectly perfect here? Tell me why. Well, I don't want you to make you, you I don't want to make you feel, Selena, that you have done something wrong, you know. Because... No, fair enough. That's the yeah. wrong language. I'm here to learn though. So, you know, show me what's the better okay, way. And even look, better yeah. if. <laughs> <laughs> Better if, of course, if you have an opportunity and you're talking about um, a particular First Nations people or country, that you you find out what that what that name is. So then you can speak specifically about Ghana country, uh, for example, which is where we are here in in Adelaide. Um, if you're trying to speak more generally about uh, First Nations people, that's um, the terminology that is uh, in fairly wide use now. Of course, you might be speaking specifically about Aboriginal people and not about Torres Strait Islander people. Um, and in fact, using that combined term of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, that's okay too. In the end, if you have an opportunity to ask um, a First Nations person that you are interacting with what their preference is, then do that. Because, you know, when you think about um, the size of Australia and the number of peoples that um, are the first owners, the first custodians, the, the first people of this place, everyone has their own feeling about the way that they would like to be um, spoken about. And so we need to um, be aware and understanding and respectful of that in the same way that we would be respectful of the Spaniard who doesn't want to be called Polish, funnily enough. Um, so... <laughs> I, I think it's worth considering in that way, but um, to to assist with that, we actually do have on our website a language and terminology guide that we use that guides our work and that you're more than welcome to have a look at. Um, it's not um, the way things must be. Um, it's not prescriptive. It's just how we uh, use use language and terminology um, throughout our organisation. And, and if you'd like to have a look at that, please do. Yes. We'll pop that in the show notes. So yeah, well, we'd easy. love you to. Thank you. That'd I, be love, I love that when you, you describe the Spanish person not wanting to be Polish, because coming from England, I can tell you now, if someone accused me of being Welsh or Scottish or Ireland, Irish, mm. my husband is Welsh, he would never allow me to call him English. That would mm. be. So like, we might have a United Kingdom, there's a lot of history between yeah there's a lot of history and yeah. and even in england you know like i'm from the midlands where everybody talks like this like a birmingham um and <laughs> i don't anymore i used to um but you know there's northerners and there's southerners and the northerners and the southerners are very different you know like so i totally get that england is a an incredibly ancient civilization but the difference is we've been allowed to continue and keep those stories of our culture and those elements you know, even against Europe and France and Germany, you know, like all of that, right or wrong, is still present and a really big part of our culture, amusingly, you know. Um, and you're right, as a an expat coming into a different country, I don't get a sense of that here for the First Nations people. Thank you so much for explaining that. I just felt like I had to give that the English context for any other Poms listening. Um, I really resonated with that. I was like, oh, yeah, that makes so much sense to me. Yeah, I just noticed that because the language of the standards isn't First Nation. It's 
ATSI, isn't it? So, you know, what, as a teacher coming to the standards, do you feel like those standards are a bit intimidating? Are they, what is it about those standards that makes us go, oh, run away backwards, do you think? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I feel as though that was uh, my experience as a teacher <clears throat> was that um, I found the way that they've been worded this is just my opinion too, by the yeah, way. <laughs> yeah. I do feel as though it is intimidating, you know, to say that we should have as a graduate uh, a broad understanding and knowledge of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures. <clears throat> I feel as though that that can instantly put someone on the back foot, you know. Well, I certainly don't have that. And even once I've, um, you know, reached... Uh, the time where I'm ready to move into the proficient stage, then um, do I do I have a broad knowledge and understanding? Potentially not. You know, most of us don't. The, the trouble is, I think, is that most of us went through schooling um, with that same lack of education. So even though, um, you know, you might come over here as an English person and say, wow, I really knew nothing. Well, most of us know nothing. And I think that's... Uh, that's a sad indictment really on on the education system. However, uh, there's strong work to improve that. And I think having those standards, um, those eight school standards there are a reminder of what we really need to do. And of course, the Australian curriculum incorporates the Aboriginal and cross um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, histories and cultures cross curriculum priority. That is a very long title too, by the way. <laughs> Take yes, some that's another thing. Up. It's hard to even say it out loud. Yes. yes. Especially after but, three coffees because it's the end of term two. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just add to that, Emily, that I think that if you do look at those standards, it says to understand and be proficient in these things of, of histories, cultures and languages. And if you go yes. back to this idea that Australia is not just <laughs> one group of Aboriginal people, it, you have to think of Australian Aboriginal um, people groups as Europe. And I was at, when I was a, a young fellow studying, I did modern European history, and you would never look at German history in the same way as you look at Italian or French history. You would, you would treat each one separately with that respect, and you'd learn that. And we tend not to do that here. So this is a big ask to actually understand history, the, the cultures, plural, the languages, plural, yeah. and to really show that respect. So it's a tricky thing. So it's all well and good to put it there. But what are the mechanisms we're putting in place to build that proficiency, to build that confidence, to help teachers? So it's it's a great thing, but it's a really hard thing too. Yeah, thank you for acknowledging that on behalf of everyone listening. And you're right. Yeah, you know, and, and based on that, I mean, would you start with your local country and your local language? Like for me, the Ghana people here, I'm assuming, I'm hoping. You know, like um, I know that I live right next to a very significant indigenous site i live in in moana too much information but come find me um near a very significant and i'm giving my location away now but I'm, i live near a very significant place down here in the Onkaparinga council um and all of the streets around me that uh i've been here a while have um like carco drive and things like that they all have very and someone explained to me that a lot of these are coming from the local language and and it was in honor of that and i'm like oh wow i had no idea i just thought they were weird you know like that's the level of ignorance that i have but it's beautiful that um i can be curious and i can ask those questions and i can i can choose to join a tour guide and i can learn and you know even if the first thing you did was look on your local council's website and find out if someone's doing a local tour just to get to know your own backyard. You know, there's some beautiful, amazing stuff. I love history. That's one of my things. Um, and so I'm used to being in a country where the history goes back and back and back. And here that feels like there's a huge gap. Like the oldest house in Adelaide is like Ayers House and that's really protected. When my husband grew up in a house that was like 100 years older than that, it's nowhere near as loved and protected because that's not a big deal. There's a shop in Sully Hall that was built in the 11th century that is literally a clothes shop. Like that is how, how much stuff we have. But here, there, there is no medieval, It's there, but there's nothing. It's like we don't, it's gone. And that really scares me and makes me feel really sad because I would love to connect with what I would consider the real history. You know, so, you know, can we do that work? The South Australian Museum, are there resources that you have that could guide us to trying to find out a little bit more about that history, that culture, those languages? Yeah, I think so. I think um, when you said the real history and there's nothing left, I go, 
I think that we've got to correct that thinking because I, un I understand that completely, this idea of there's an ancient building and you can find out that it was a flour mill and this happened. But actually what we've got in Australia is we've got story and that the story of the land. And as you travel the land, if you have the privilege, I was in, I was in um, Kakadu recently hearing the sitting on a thing with a, 300 tourists looking out over something and I had the wife of the traditional owner there and she just told us the story and if you have ears to hear you actually begin to go wow this is incredibly ancient and it gets passed on from generation to generation maybe not the the bricks and mortar that you see that you can go hey that was the room where somebody lived you go actually this was the land where they traveled and they shared and they passed on these stories from generation to generation I sat in a river in Catherine with a, an, an indigenous cultural leader and he just told us stories and he just, he just drew things in the in the sand. And it made me feel connected to an ancient story much more than even just looking at a building that's sitting there. So I think that's really I've got to interrupt you because that is that's just hitting the nail on the head. Right. That's part of my cultural understanding of history. Right. My cultural understanding of history is we go to a tour of the mill in Manchester and we go to the big stately home and we learn about the gunpowder plot and how that has a secret hole for the priest to hide in. You know, that is how my culture taught history it's about physical things and you can touch them culturally the history is an oral history you're right it's a very different way of looking at it i think that's really important because that's a shift that's an understanding that i'm developing now already even, of first even, nations even, culture look at me go woohoo progress in adelaide selena it didn't happen easily but i built a relationship with one of the local leaders who took us on a tour of adelaide and took us to uh, places at Seaford where you walk up the stairs and you look over at the Chibruki, um statue up there that looks out over the water and then he showed me pictures of this um, sacred site there and you could actually go down the bottom of those stairs and you could find that water hole that where where these pictures were but it had been decimated by colonization there's a caravan park there now and it's just weeds and there's no real um care of country any longer in, in some of those places and it's not because the stories aren't there there's some great stories at marion just um at near the caravan park too there and there's a little cultural site but you need someone who can guide you to explain what the significance of these places and we haven't valued those traditionally and so we've built over them and we've we've created these cities and said oh now where's the local people we can connect with and we asked them to share their stories and we've built over these things and we've devalued them and we haven't listened so it's a new posture to actually go and say Hey, I want to recognise the damage that's been done and I want to sit and listen. And, you know, you, you may be very fortunate to get someone who's willing to open up, but there's been a lot of damage done too. So it's not quite as simple as just asking someone to come and share their life story and all the histories and the knowledges of the past. That's a, it's a shift that's taking place and it's good, but it's going to take time to build trust too. Yeah, I'm just thinking about that. That is, you know, if we don't listen and we don't make space to hear those stories then again we're just perpetuating what the first settlers said and went oh there's no city here so no one lives here so it's mine what no that's just you not understanding how these people live their lives um yeah, yeah, yeah that's really interesting yeah the phrase that we used we came across earlier i said listen learn live we've got to listen to the voices of indigenous people learn about our shared history and how it's still having implications to this day before we work out how we're going to live together. Most people want to go straight to the live park. Let's find an Aboriginal person and work out how we can build relationship without listening and learning. And our school system hasn't helped that because we've actually had a hidden, we've hidden it in the curriculum. And that's why all the three of us said this at the start, we go, how do we not know? Well, it's actually been built into our curriculum to say, we don't want to talk about this uncomfortable truth of our past, but you, Took look at countries like Germany, they go, we've got a really checkered history, particularly in this, um, you know, the 20th century, what happened in the Second World War, but we're going to make sure that we never make those mistakes again. So this is going to be built into our curriculum and no child will grow up without knowing what took place to make sure it doesn't take place again. I think that's what the shift needs to be as we go, we need to wrestle with our past without the blame, the shame, the guilt in order to make sure we don't go back there again with policies and practices and attitudes and behaviours. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. And that does require bravery and that does require curiosity, like you're saying. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and I, I think mean, that Emily, what would you add to that? Yeah. I wanted to say that that what you were just saying about bravery, um, it does take a little bit of that and it does take vulnerability as well. And um, in my own experience and, you know, teaching that year 10 unit, I had to say openly to my students, you know what, guys, I'm actually learning this too. 
Um, so if you can bear with me, we're going to figure it out together on the on, yeah. on the road. Yeah. So um, I think that's a really important part of the learning is to nobody actually expects you to know. That's the first thing to remember. Um, first Nations people aren't going around saying you should know all this cultural information. You know, that's actually their knowledge. So um, what we're trying to do is create um, teaching resources for use in the classroom so that you can go forward as a teacher with some reliable information that meets the curriculum and helps you meet those eights or standards that that might feel a bit onerous you know so to be able to um, go into a, a teaching resource about a topic that is relevant to your teaching and find a couple of activities that might be your first small step your first small step might even just be to acknowledge to your class the country that you're on or you might want to put up the IATSIS um, Indigenous map of Indigenous Australia that shows all the countries um, across Australia. Um, but if you're ready to start teaching, then those resources are out there. And we have resources that can help you um, whichever of those stages that you're at, whether it's as graduate, proficient, um, you know, full lead. We've got professional development um, a professional development workshop that is appropriate really and the name says it all it's a, our building confidence workshop and it's about making sure that teachers a have an understanding of the past and the reason why it's relevant today and what their role is in um in making sure that that australia understands all of that um, and why the teaching of it is so important um, but also giving them a sense of uh, not ownership, that's the wrong word, but that that sense of I can have a go. Mm. You don't have to walk in there and be the knowledge holder. You know, what you're doing is you're encouraging your students to care, to think about it, to compare, to celebrate for goodness sake, to celebrate First Nations cultures and the role that they have in our in our country today, but for the last 60,000 plus years, you know, that is a history worth getting excited about. And sadly, yes, some of those sites, some of those flour mills um, are being destroyed. And it's very, very sad. But I think the more of our students who will then go out into the world and be councilmen and women, politicians, journalists, teachers themselves, nurses, whatever it is that they're going out to do, they're doing it with an understanding of First Nations cultures, histories, perspectives, and that they can bring that into their work. That's what we want to see happen. And we're making a choice to move away from that ignorance, move towards empowerment yeah, so that absolutely. the young people of Australia can make that choice. Yeah. <laughs> if we don't give them what they need, they can't make that choice. We're taking that away from them. And that's not cool either. Like, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't oh, think sorry. it involves some bravery, though, and vulnerability. I think you're absolutely yeah. right. And I love that you guys are kind of saying, hey, look, we've done a bit of the work for you, quite a large amount of the work for you. Um, <laughs> we've got the content. So, you know, you can get a broad knowledge by coming to our website and relying on us to provide you with a broad range of resources and ideas that can support you as you take these steps. Mm. And I love as a teacher being able to say, actually, I don't know much, let's do this together because it becomes about the learning journey together. Absolutely. Um, there's nothing wrong with that with kids. They love that, you know, they're like, all right, then cool. Um, so some kids will be like, brilliant, I know more than you. And then they'll just show off and we might spark a passion that's going to make a massive difference to the planet and to this country in the future because that person has been empowered at the age of whatever nine mm -hmm. and it just sparks a thing you know that we do a powerful job here as educators yeah so thing that you're saying Emily, and absolutely. we really need to first empower the teachers though to do that work and i think <laughs> what we really want teachers to remember is that again we nobody expects um, the knowledge to be complete at any stage it doesn't matter what subject you teach you're you're still learning and so to 
imagine that you have to be at a certain level um, of knowledge when it comes to teaching uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures and perspectives. It's, well, it's misguided, I think, or it's um, been pushed upon us. It's not, that's not the case. You can start this work and build your knowledge in the same way that if you were to walk into, you know, your job tomorrow, which has, happens to teachers sometimes, and they say, oh, by the way, English teacher, you're now teaching business just for this semester because Jenny's off, you know, she's she's going to, um, she's going on a trip around Europe or something. So suddenly you have to teach business. Now, what would your approach be? Do you know what? I don't know. I'm not confident. I'm not going to do it. No, you do what teachers do mm -hmm. every single day around the country, around the world, and you start to find out and you share what you can as you learn it and you build on that knowledge and you learn from your students. How beautiful is that? The number of students that I've learned from in my work um, with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, topics that we've studied is, is magical. You know, their willingness to to be open and to have their ways of thinking that may already have started to solidify thanks to um, you know parents and family and community that that are um, uneducated and and haven't had that opportunity to hear from First Nations people and you know to see that shifting and to see that understanding come into people's eyes as I was saying with the the principal at, at the workshop um, the other week you know it was so touching to to know that the minute that people start to learn the understanding balloons mm. Matt, not you know just out of control that 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 realization that there is so much that I can do rather than what can I do? You know, rather than that sense of, oh, how am I supposed to do this? I've got no idea, I don't have any time, etc. And these are all valid arguments. But rather than taking that approach, why me? How about, well, how can it be me? What do I need to do for it to be me? It's not even why not me, because that's a little bit argumentative as well, isn't it? That's a bit cruel. Why not me? No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> How I guess it's just choosing to not be the victim and going, well, I don't know. Yeah. No one taught me. So absolutely what I'm do there is perpetuate that problem for the next generation. So the next logo, I don't know. Uh, you know, like you were saying, Stuart, you just instead of being the victim, let's be the hero and go, right, I'm imperfect. I need a mentor. I need a Yoda. I need an Obi-Wan who can help me navigate this. And by the end of this, I will have learned a thing. I will be able to build mm. a lightsaber. Or, you know, like it's that narrative, isn't it? Like, Let's choose to not be perfect and go on that journey. Absolutely. But we yeah. can be heroes of little things, you know. Yes. We don't have to save the world in that first lesson, you know. It's incremental. They're tiny steps. They're moments of failure. Let's remember yeah. that, please. You know, in the same yes. way that you, you go into your class on a topic not related to this and sometimes you stuff it up. Sometimes it doesn't work out. Sometimes the discussion doesn't go where you thought it was going to go. And you have to work with that. And it's the same. It's really yeah. just the same. And if I can, I, I just hope that um, the things that we've discussed today do give teachers that sense that, okay, I can start this. It doesn't have to be, you know, everything changes in that one day. I can build this really slowly. And that's and they all. can come to you. You can be their Yoda or their Obi Wan. <laughs> we can say providing those resources and mm -hmm. those guides and this professional learning, right? So I want to go back to the standards. I know everybody loves the standards as much as me. So Stuart, I'm gonna I'm gonna come to you now. All right. So how does this professional learning that you are running connect back to, you know, two point four and supporting us to with reconciliation and, and 1.4 and supporting students, because I'm hearing this PD could be quite a powerful tool, particularly if you're listening in Adelaide. Do you run it online as well, or do we need to be? Yeah, so, okay, wherever you are, this, this PD is gonna be an awesome tool. But if I am a leader in a school and I'm noticing these patterns, how how does this help me with these two standards? Maybe I can uh, 
tell you a little bit of a story. That day I met a, um, a principal from a school that um, has no Indigenous um, people in the whole area that they know of, um, and, you know, very um, non-diverse. And they were sitting down going, look, this is a gap, just like you, this is a gap. We are not addressing these standards, and how do we help our teachers? And so they looked around and they found our stuff, and we did some online uh, professional training. And I just want to explain that what we did is I sat down in these early years and I asked my team to record the voices of Indigenous people. And so we could tell those stories, we could amplify their voices. And in doing that, that, that were incredible stories. But uh, I remember thinking, well, what do you do with these stories now? And so I said to my team, look, come up with a framework that we can build on. And so we've got this really unique framework. We think that it's built on five key ideas that we think every Australian should know and understand. And they're five key ideas. Um, we'll make sure you get a copy of this too to put in the um, the, the notes. But it's to do with our, the wound, you know, helping people to empathise with the reason why many First Nations people experience injustice and disadvantage, because we often hear about that, don't we, in the papers. But then we look at our history. That's the second key idea. It acknowledges how our shared past continues to have an impact on our present context. The third one is, which we often find, is people have gone through the, uh, which we, this is what we do in the professional learning, the, the wound and our history. They go, oh my goodness, how did I not know? And, oh, that's terrible. And these stories are heartbreaking. But then they always get to this point, they go, well, what's it got to do with me? Wow. So we actually have our third key idea, which is why me? To appreciate the interconnectedness of Australians and to take personal responsibilities uh, to show why it's connected. The third one is our cultures. And we deliberately called it our cultures because often we go, oh, we're going to learn about Aboriginal culture. Yeah, but do you even understand your own culture? Do you understand the cultural lens that you wear? Do you understand the way, the paradigm you operate from? And so we turn it around. That is the most powerful part of everything we do is when people understand their own culture and what would it be like for them if parts of that culture were damaged or taken away or devalued. Um, and then the last one is my response, because we don't want people just to listen to this, go, that was amazing. Oh, really touched me. And oh, I can see how important that is and do nothing. So we got these five key ideas and that became the basis for everything that we do. All of the curriculum that we do, even though it matches this, you know, the CARA um, requirements, it's built on these five key ideas. So kids will grow up with a sense of knowing about our cultures and why me and our history. Um, and so the professional learning was built on this too. So when we, when this, when this principal said to me, oh, this really impacted us, I said, what did it impact? She said, we've done lots of professional learning. We've done it, you know, everyone's done it over the years. She goes, yeah, honestly, we had our first break and I could not believe how much people were buzzing and they were talking and they'd heard voices of Indigenous people for the first time. And then they began to think about what would that mean for them as a school? And she said, in the days after that professional learning, everyone got involved. Kids went into a local art store and asked if there were Aboriginal people and they, they met an Aboriginal artist who said, I can't come and do local art but my partner is a local um, First Nations person and, and she could come in. And so together they went in and did, did art together. And then they looked at some restoration of the, the river and they realised that the grant they were getting for this restoration, there was no speaking about the history of the local area. So the school took it upon themselves to actually make sure signs were done about the local people group there. So there was this amazing thing that happened in the school. And that's why I'm really confident that this professional learning will not only help meet the standards, but build the confidence in, in people doing this. So that's the feedback we've been getting. We've, we've actually had a um, research piece of research done on this with the Bachelor Institute of Indigenous, Indigenous Tertiary Education. Don't you love acronyms in the education space? Yeah, we've got lots of them. Yeah, yeah. This is, called, <laughs> this is called BITE. And in the early days, even before we've developed to where we've developed now, we delivered this professional learning and then this group went back um, six months later and then again a couple of years later to see what impact did it have on you. And they wrote a paper that talked about the transformative effect this had on just building confidence to do that one small thing and then to build on that, as Emily shared. And they've got a second part of that research being done with teachers um, as who have done more of our professional learning and also use some of our curriculum. And they're just about to prepare another paper. And they said, it is really just quite stunning to see the response it's getting from teachers who suddenly have this agency that they can do something themselves in their classroom to actually meet the standards, but actually not just that, not just tick the box, but influence their practice and shape the hearts and minds of kids. Because as Emily said, these kids are going to grow up and they're going to work in banks and they're going to be in the footy clubs and they're going to work at the local McDonald's. And if they can carry with them a changed attitude, and attitudes always shape our behaviours, 
that might address some of the racism that's still prevalent in our country. It might address some of the reasons why we've still got huge gaps in life outcomes between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. That's the aim. Um, and we've got to get through the gatekeepers, the teachers. So that's what the professional learning does. And we're doing research to make sure it does uh, it does tick those boxes of meeting the standards, but it more importantly changes the hearts and minds of teachers. And that is all that's what they're for, right? I, I know that everyone sees the standards as a box ticking exercise, not me and not the people that I work with. No, no, no. Like all of these things are here for a reason. And that's why it's really important that we don't dismiss and we don't, you know, that fear that fear is probably what's causing it. It's a defensive response of it's mm -hmm. not mine, it's defensive. It's it's your brain going, but I'm in my comfort zone. I don't want to deal with all of that trauma. It's not my trauma. You know, like it's totally human totally normal but like we've been discussing it's actually not serving us it's not serving our kids and it's definitely not serving the first nations people of this country we are i get a sense that we are missing out on an awful lot of amazing knowledge and understanding about the place we live because we probably quite right Stuart, don't look at how our own cultural lens is biasing us you know like I even during this conversation I've gone oh yeah that's because history to me is an old house with a with a priest hole not like a story on the river you know that's me applying my cultural lens of my childhood and, and now I'm like oh, okay I get that now you know and but still I'd be like can we put a plaque you know like I need a thing to look at <laughs> you know like all right that's what you need we'll do that and that's what you see popping up right whereas perhaps that's not really that necessary in the long term you know, I love, I love that. I loved when I spoke to you guys originally, this, what comes out for me and what really um, resonates with me is that this is all coming from the heart. This is all coming from the very teacherly way that we all think, which is making a difference in young people's lives and healing things. It gives a lot of sense from you guys of healing the wound, as you keep saying to us, which is beautiful. And the part that we can choose to play in that it's absolutely amazing so we've talked a lot about curiosity we have talked a lot about bravery we've talked a lot about needing to come from the heart and and it sounds like and i know because i've had a good look that the, you know your resources kind of underpin that and allow us to not get stuck on the oh well i don't have a broad knowledge so i'll just run away like that's cool we, we'll give you the knowledge here's the stuff the knowledge now it's up to you as the teacher to work out how you are going to engage your kids hearts minds and make a difference with this i think that's why it was quite powerful when i was teaching it because i walked into those classrooms with all of that anger and resentment for my own country and that would have made the kids go whoa perhaps they weren't used to that i don't know like i was horrified and i was like we need to talk about this you know like i i can't even remember the numbers but it was things like um First Nations people were counted as fauna and flora or something. And I was like, what? That, what? That, what? You know, like things like that's just so disrespectful. What? I just was, my mind was blown. And these poor students were witnessing me having these mind blown moments. And I've hopefully influenced them to also go, oh, you know, maybe that's like you say, not what they used to. So, you know, I was totally imperfect and messy, but I showed up. I was curious. I was brave. And we influenced each other as we tried to move through that journey together and I just think that there's nothing more beautiful in a classroom than when you can do that you know I think that's absolutely amazing Later so on, I think the other thing about that is that we recognize teachers are incredibly overwhelmed with what they're expected to do so this is not just another subject that you've got to squeeze in it's no. actually part of what you're already being asked to do and it enriches what you're being asked to do mm. and having a group of people like us and the team that we work with doing all that heavy lifting so that you can just incorporate this into your planning is really important because this is this is exciting and you know we're we're really motivated the three of us talking about it but not everyone else is so you've got to have some some small wins so i always say to people and particularly i've worked with corporates who are doing rap plans and doing all this stuff i go can i just really encourage everyone to do one small thing and celebrate it and then do another small thing and celebrate that and just see and just see if it becomes part of the way that you teach, the way that you think, the what comes out. If a school, you know, it's very difficult for an individual teacher if the whole school is not supporting this, but you can still make a change in your little corner of the world. And that's why while we've got the building culture workshop, which is for the whole group or the whole school to do, we've got another one called 
uh, sorry, the Building Confidence Workshop. We've got another one called Exploring Culture, and we we talk about understanding your own culture. And so this is a one hour thing that an individual teacher could do just as a starting point for them. But then you've got all that curriculum to choose and to build into your classroom too. So we do want to recognise it's busy, it's hard, you're dealing with all sorts of issues in the classroom that when I was teaching years ago wasn't nearly as hard as it is today and that's why you need support and you need people who can champion what you're trying to do and of course if it comes from the the leadership and everyone's involved in it that's a much easier environment but even if you're the only one you might be the only one that uh, that shares these things into the children's lives and they'll carry that with them so I think there's a very powerful role that teachers play but they need help absolutely one small step that's basically yeah. it, We're picking Neil Armstrong now, but it's pretty much that line, isn't it? You mm -hmm. know, you if you're listening to this or watching this and you're a lead teacher, there's an opportunity here for you to review unit plans, go to the Australians Together website, see if you can make it so that every one unit plan in every term has some aspect of First Nations culture or First Nations something in it. Maybe that's something you're going to work on. Mm. Uh, but of course, the, making sure that the teachers have some time to put that in place you know yes um yes. yeah because mm. that's the biggest issue isn't it i don't have time and mm -hmm. so that's why starting small is also really important because that it, it gets um to a point where you've met, taken those first small steps whether you're a, a lead teacher or um, a graduate teacher you've started taking those steps and it builds, doesn't it? It doesn't matter what you're doing. You slowly, um, your confidence and your knowledge builds. And so you're able to do more with that. Um, and starting small might also be asking straight away for some help. Is there anyone else in your year level or your department or um, your team that is also interested in learning? Not in changing the world again, not in making everything um, right immediately, but who would like to work with me on this? I just want to. I just want to find out more. Or I want curious to... with me. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. You know, and if you're using edufolios and you're like me, and that standard is very way woefully poor, find someone else who's also in the same boat and go and explore together using yep. you guys. Compare notes. You know, lean That's... on each other for support. I love what you're doing. I hope that everyone listening goes to the website. And explores and if you are watching this on YouTube I think it would be really interesting if you commented below this video one small thing that you could do in the yeah. next couple of weeks because then anyone else who's sitting there going I don't know can have a look at what you've written and you might yeah. inspire someone else to take one small step so maybe below this video you can let us know or you can DM us on socials at edufolios or with Australians together as well. We're going to make sure that all of these resources, the five key ideas, the language and terminology, and of course, a link directly to all of your wonderful PD and your wonderful resources are all on the show notes today. I just think this was an incredibly important episode. Please give us some feedback. Let us know if there's any questions that you have uh, that we haven't addressed. I'm sure that Stuart and Emily wouldn't mind me dropping them an email and uh, coming up with some answers for you. I know and I want to recognise how scary this can be. I know because I feel it too. I've been mildly ignoring it for as long as possible. I'm trying to be brave and I hope you've witnessed me today <laughs> saying the wrong thing, but not really, in the path of learning. You know, I've now learned First Nations people, you know, ATSI, even though that's what it says in the curriculum. Like I've took, taken away three or four amazing new learnings today that I'm going to go reflect on in my edufolio in a moment so that I can actually start getting evidence against the ADSI stuff. And it will be graduate evidence. And I've been teaching for 21 years, but that's OK. Right? I've got to start somewhere. That's going to be my first small step is just sitting there and letting all of this. Yeah, just go through me and make sense of it and connect with it. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. This has been an incredibly valuable experience. And I just appreciate you both and all of the amazing work that you are doing because, yeah, it's really important work. So thank you. Thank you, Selena. We appreciate you giving us the platform to share and hope we can really encourage some teachers to take some steps. And we'll be celebrating in the days ahead that uh, that we're in a better country and um, we're re wrestling with the past, but actually celebrating the future too. Absolutely. We're all about celebration here. Absolutely. Any excuse for cheesecake, as far as I'm concerned, is, is important. So that's wonderful. Thank you so much again for your time.
That's fine. I just wanted to mention one more thing, which I should have mentioned okay. much earlier, and that is that all of our curriculum resources that we have on the website are free to use. So there is another reason um, to take a small step and, and see if there's something there for you and for your students. Absolutely. So no charge there for the curriculum resources. Of course not. I kind of assume but you're right, we should make that very explicit. Go and have a look. You have no reason not to be brave and have a little dig around the Australian Together website. I'm even going to put a link to make it really easy in the show notes. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. That's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you.